Well, leaders, thanks so much for tuning in to a, a special edition of Leadership Podcast. And uh, I'll tell you, at a season like this, I'm grateful for friends. And so we have three friends joining us today. Judd Wilhite from Las Vegas, uh, lead pastor of Central Church there. Um, Kevin Queen from Nashville, Cross Point. And also Trisha Shortino from Belay Solutions. And you're the new CEO there. So talk about a time to step into leadership. My goodness. Welcome to all of you. Yeah, thank you. Great to be with you, Gary. Judd, you said something before we started recording that just hit me. And can you repeat it? That's why I'm like, we better just record. Well, um, yeah, I think the question was, are you okay? Mm. <laughs> and, uh, I think the answer, you know, there's layers to that answer, but as a leader, you don't really have a choice but to be okay. I mean, now is the time where everybody looks to us. Uh, your team is looking to you. Your city is looking to you. Your circle of influence is looking to you. And um, in times of crisis, I always feel like uh, I go into leader mode and I, I'll process the crisis maybe even a year after it happens, six months after it happens. But for a leader, you don't really have time to emotionally process the crisis in the middle of it. You have to lead. Yeah, that's interesting. I've been waking up at 4 a.m. every day. I was just saying to my wife, like waking up at 4 a.m. I'm not even leading our church day to day, but I just feel the burden for all the leaders. And Tricia, how about you? How, how has this hit you personally? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I feel the absolute same way. I was kind of sharing that, um, you know, these are the moments we've uh, weren't sure if they would come, but here they are. Um, it's, it's sometimes easier to lead when the economy's great and uh, the world is functioning the way we think it's supposed to, but times like these really test, you know, your character and strength as a leader. And, and to your point, it's, it's really not an option. This is all what we've kind of been called to do. I feel like I've, you know, been poised in this position for, for good reason. And, um, like you, I, I do, I kick into leader mode. I feel like, um, the high emotional intelligence means, you know, I'll, I'll process the information later, but now we've got a job to do. So let's roll up our sleeves and make really smart decisions for a whole lot of people who are looking up to us. Kevin, checking in with you, man, you, your, your most recent crisis management happened two weeks ago when you got hit by a tornado. And here we are in the middle of this and we're recording this on a Monday. The president is speaking uh, as we record this. The prime minister of Canada is speaking as we record this. And even if we try to respond to that, it would probably all be different by Wednesday anyway. So, Kevin, do you want to you want to check in? How are you doing? It makes me makes me think of a, I had a professor that said something, probably the most helpful thing in grad school. He said the greatest gift that a leader gives in a crisis situation is a non anxious presence. Mm. And he said, that's, he said, as a leader's anxiety is down and the entire room, the entire group, their anxiety comes down as well. So I think as a leader, we have to, um, and as, as followers of Jesus, you know, I remember, I think about when the disciples were in that room with the door locked for fear and Jesus came in and he breathed on them and he said, my spirit, I give to you my peace. I give to you. And I think we have to be, we have to be the ones out in front, but we have to be the ones who are filled with peace because um, our peace is contagious as well. So we have to get to that non-anxious place. And, uh, and that takes work, right? I mean, that's, uh, that takes work. We have to go first in that. And so I'm just trying to, trying to lead out of that place, Carrie, and, uh, and trying to get some peace and then be able to lead from that, from that place. It's not automatic. It takes work. You gotta, you gotta dig for the gold, but it's there, you know, and, uh, and it, it's the most helpful thing I think we can hand out. So can we start there? Non-anxious presence? I think you're right. How do, how do you even begin that? I mean, particularly, and Kevin, I'll go right back to you, you know, tornado, week one, so to speak. When, well, when did the tornado hit? What was the actual date? So, um, you know, I walked into a situation where I'd never been a lead pastor before and had a great team and a great church and great people just looking for leaders. So that's when some of this, you know, training of going, man, I need, I need to find peace. And it really um, carried back, gosh, years before that. I was like, man, I, I want to build a prayer life that I can hand off to my kids. And so I think some of that training, like I think we can all look back in our past and see God has built us for this. He's used things and circumstances in our life to build and construct us for moments like this. So I think prayer is a big part of um, putting that pressure on God, you know, just continually put that put that pressure and put that dependence on him and uh, 
man, there's desperation. And God is the only person that's attracted to it, you know, to that desperation. It's just continue to put it on him so we can be at a place of peace. So the tornado hit, that's a long answer to a really short question. But the tornado <laughs> hit, like, um, it was, it was, gosh, it seems like forever ago, but it was, it was a little over, a little over a week ago. So two, a week and a half ago. What was the specific date for people not listening in real time? Gosh, March, March, March 3rd. March 3rd. And we're recording this on March, yeah, what day is it? 16th. Okay, it's Monday. So literally two weeks ago, you're hit by a tornado. And then last week, the whole economy, coronavirus, lockdown. And as we speak, it's changing in real time. And probably by the time this airs, a whole different future for all of us. Markets are crashing. I mean, none of us have led through this before. Not like this, not like this. Um, Non-anxious presence. So Kevin, I know that's a big part of your legacy so far at Crosspoint is prayer. You had prayer every Tuesday, which now will probably have to happen virtually. But um, any other thoughts on non-anxious presence as a leader? Yeah, I, I think having some other people that you pray with is important. You know, when Jesus is like, hey, two or three get together, like I'm going to show up, I'll be right there in the mix. And so I think we all have kind of solitude, our personal prayer life, but there's such value in having a couple other people that you can unite with in and that you can pray and that you can, you can actually, you borrow off of their faith sometimes and that you can share what you're processing, what you're feeling and have them come together with you in prayer. So I wouldn't want to leave without having a couple people that, uh, that I pray with. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's been super helpful as well. Other thoughts on non-anxious presence? Well, I think the simple principle of, uh, you know, you got to feed your faith to starve your fears and, uh, you know, We've got to be exposed to what's happening in the media and the culture, you know, on a timely basis. We have to have open hearts and minds. We just have to be super intentional about how we balance the headlines of the world with the headlines of the Bible in our own hearts. And I think um, I think time with God, time in his word every morning, especially in a crisis where you wake up to a hundred texts on your phone and everybody needs you but you have to spend that time with god it's the most important half hour 15 minutes of the day you know in a crisis to maintain that non-anxious presence so for me it's uh and, I, and then I, I i tend to i i don't find certain platforms of social media helpful in a crisis uh, you know um so, so some are more helpful than others and so for me, I tend to kind of know what, what I don't open and what I do open. I, I'm a more of a headline scanner. And then I read a few articles if I need to because of things are changing. And I just start managing the, the amount of like fear-inducing material I'm allowing in my heart with the amount of faith-inducing material I'm allowing in my heart and trying to balance those. It's a tension. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think um, being mindful of what it is you allow in your headspace. Um, I, I'm with you. I'm absolutely um, very particular about what I will listen to, what I will read, um, who I will listen to, because um, that stuff, you know, can really seep into your soul and your heart. And so it's like, what, do you, what are you allowing to speak to you? Is, is it the right sources? Is it the right people? Um, and being able to decipher different pieces of information to to guide you in your in your calm and I think um, to your point keeping some of it away from you is sometimes what's most healthy for you yeah let's talk about filters because I've found this I can't remember a time where I feel like I've had spent more time trying to find quality information and more struggles trying to find quality information and you know, I've been on the WHO site, the Center for Disease Control. I'm fortunate to be connected to the medical community locally. So uh, they've been really good in answering my questions. But uh, this has been really tough. How do you sort out? Like, because there's hype on the one hand, like all the hysteria. And then there's like, oh, wait a minute, this may actually be a real threat. How have you processed that those filters, that filter as leaders in this crisis? Well, I, yeah, I find that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to the CDC's website. I'm going, I'm going to whose website. I'm not looking at Twitter for my factual information. <laughs> and frankly, like, I'm not watching broadcast news shows for that information. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to lean into uh, the best 
the best sort of core information out there, remembering that you know, a lot of the news and media is a, is a business. They're, they're publicly traded companies. Uh, it's clicks for cash, you know, so we, so they're under their own tension, right? And um, so, you know, I've got to, so I just try to, I don't have the answer. That's just what I try to do for what it's worth. I try, I'm trying to get to respectable sites that aren't necessarily going to overreact, you know, but when the Center of, for Disease Control says no more groups over 50, you sort of stop in your tracks. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, like yeah. That's serious. You know, that's not like a thought. That's 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 a serious statement. Any anything else on sorting through the news um, in all this? Because I think that's been a real part of the problem. I feel like it's been overplayed in some circles and completely underplayed in others. Um, Kevin, Tricia, anything? Well, I can I can speak in like the past couple past couple days. It's just some key sources, like some people. I start looking at people who are experts and picking up the phone and calling and saying, "Hey, can you let me know in a three minute phone call? I can get more accurate news from the right people than you know thirty minutes or three hours of watching the news." So, uh, so just trying to pick up the phone and tap into experts and people that I trust, without naming names, because it may not even be helpful. But what kind of person would you be looking to for that? So doctors, people in the healthcare uh, field, um, you know, Nashville's kind of headquarters for um, healthcare industry in many respects. So picking up the phone and calling, it's just some people there, and and uh, and had just those conversations have been have been super helpful. And at the same time, being able to pray with them, you know, and be mm-hmm. a be a be a source of peace and strength, and and maybe give a word of encouragement to them because they're they're carrying you know heavy load right now. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Trisha, how have you navigated that? Yeah, I would say the same. Um, just connecting to individuals in the in the health industry, as well as the, um, you know, the CDC and the World Health Organization, have been the places where I've been leaning into information that I feel is most reasonable and uh, and right, and and trying to stay off of social media, and not using that as the place where I get sucked into. There's a lot of rhetoric and emotion going out on Facebook and Instagram right now, and I'm trying to remove uh, myself from some of it. Not so that I don't understand the pulse of what people are feeling. I want to be connected enough that I'm not not um, disconnecting myself from what you know people are honestly feeling and suffering through right now um, so that we can provide answer. So I feel like it's a great source, maybe social media, to get context of what people are feeling as a global community, but to leverage it to then say, okay, these are, these are um, groups of fears that I'm seeing different people come to the table with and how can we provide answer for that? Is there other resources we can provide to um, groups of people who are worried about how am I going to work from home? Are there resources we can provide for people who don't know how they're going to feed their children lunch next week because they're not going to be in school to get lunch? So I think social media has its place. It's just not for health information more than it's for you know, community understanding. Each of you has a public voice as well. We're consumers of online content, but we're also creators of online content. You know, you all lead teams, significant size staffs, and in a couple of cases, large congregations. How do you, what guidelines, principles, thoughts go through your mind when you are crafting your own communication? You know, how much do you say, how do you angle that? Any tips? Because, you know, the thousands of leaders listening to this, that's their job too. They lead their community. They lead their staff. They lead their church. They lead their organization. They lead their not-for-profit. And like you said, cultivating that non-anxious presence is really important. So how do you do that as a leader um, in the way that you shape your words, statements, messages? Uh, I, so I think it's important for us to think about our social media platforms and our audiences. And some, some people have more of a national audience, national platform, sort of. I'm a pastor at my very core. And while I may have a little bit of that audience, I, I tend to view things through the filter of the people I'm called the shepherd. And I just think that's important to state as my filter. So I'm always thinking about the faces and the names of the people that I'm called to lead. Uh, through our church ministry, other people that that click on or may watch, you know, that are a part, that, that's great. But 
but that's how I'm leveraging social media for me. And I, and I'm not saying that's the way everybody else should do it. So that becomes a filter for me. I'm wanting to provide hope and spiritual encouragement. I don't feel like I have to comment on everything. I don't feel like I have to make a statement on everything. I'm more focused on how do I bring some balance to maybe some of the other things that are flying around from a spiritual standpoint and, and shepherd my people well. Yeah, and I think for me, um, being that we're an organization that has led and run, run virtually, um, we're seeing so many people in fear of how to how to work from home, how to move their organizations from um, working in offices to sending employees home, and and can they still function as an organization um, and keep the health of the organization? So I feel a you know, we're compelled, I feel very compelled to get messages out there on content around how you can do this, you know, giving people resources. You can continue some of what you do um, virtually, just like I've seen so many um, churches do online services um, on Sundays. Um, You can, you know, replicate all that in business and, you know, giving people the tools to help them you know, in, and in and of itself, that creates its own sense of calm um, instead of panic. Like, oh, my gosh, my boss told me I'm going to start working from home on Monday and I have no idea how I'm going to do my job. Um, my kids are home and uh, I, I'm not sure how this is actually going to work. So, you know, for for me, I'm, I'm trying to provide resources or want to provide continued resources on how people can continue to get through the day to day and still work. Um, and help their organizations thrive to, to keep our economy parts of it going, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, we don't need to shut the doors on every every business out there. We, we actually need to help them keep running. Um, so if we can um, put content out there that's going to help any business figure out how to keep doing business um, without being in an office, that's absolutely where we feel compelled to add value. For me, I mean, w- on our team meeting this morning, we talked about like that is our current ministry as an organization mm. is how we can help how how we can help minister organizations to keep on keeping on um, so that we don't have further um, economic repercussions. That's an interesting approach. So rather than respond to the noise, respond to the thing, you're like, no, we're just going to, we're just going to help. And here's some things that can help. That's interesting. Kevin, I've seen you because I've watched some of your Instagrams, you know, the double crisis you're in right now with no building, you were a portable church for a week. Now you're a virtual church. It's like just head snapping the (laughs) the stuff you've been through. Uh, How do you curate that kind? Oh, dude. Yeah. Yeah, maybe for five years from now, right, Kevin? After you've after you've been in the wilderness for a while. <laughs> oh, but you have a very calm presence about you. You really, really do. Um, I think that's you generally, but you've kept it together. Well, I, so let me give a couple of things. I think I think one is the 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 heart is is where the message comes from. So, like, I've got a friend named Chip who tells me he's a counselor. He says, Kevin, you got to feel the feelings tell yourself the truth, and then embrace life on life's terms. And so feeling the feelings is being honest. I mean, I've been asked, how are you more in the past two weeks than any other time in my life? But there are a few people who will say, how are you doing really? And when they ask really, that's when I get to go to, okay. And that's when you pick up the rocks and you go, that's where the squiggly and crawly things are, the things under the surface. And you're able to talk through, man, I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm tired. I'm I'm uncertain. You know, we start going through these, these feelings and then we tell ourselves the truth. And this is where we remind ourselves of the things that in an uncertain world, Carrie, that we, we're willing to die for. These are our core convictions. These are the things that we build our life upon. This is the, the storm that's come, the rock that we're building on. And I think we have to get to that place of bedrock. And then I think the embrace life's on, life on life's terms. We can't live in denial. This world is jacked up. It's broken. It's fallen. It's filled with uncertainty. We can't live in denial, but we live from a place of truth. So I think I have to get to that place at my heart level before I craft a communication. And then the communication, I, I know personally that I want it to be spirit led, that I want it to be scripture fed, that I want it to be laced with hope. I want there to be hope all over it. And then I want it to be Jesus centered. I mean, this is the time. This is the opportunity that we have to point to Jesus where people are looking. Well, where do I go? And we can point them to Jesus. And then I also want to lift up stories when I can. 
Um, I don't think this is a time where we tell the church necessarily, this is what the church needs to do. We hold up stories and we honor stories and testimonies of like the church being the church, right? And then people go, okay, I'm going to follow that example. So we've got some beautiful, a guy told me, uh, Todd Atkins wrote me a text and he said, Kevin, he said, your church, from everything I've seen online, your church is a mess. He said, your church is a mess, but your church is beautiful. And, uh, and I'm like, man, that, that is the picture. So we look around with eyes of wonder and going, where is the church beautiful right now? And how can we hold that up? And I think that inspires people to want to walk in that way. So, um, yeah. What's been the hardest part of the current crisis personally for each of you? I think for me, um, I, I tend to be more of an instinctive leader and mm-hmm. instinctive leaders. I actually really thrive in crisis because I can make decisions fast and, and we go and it's, it's, I don't know. It's like, I'm made for this, you know, like I'm, I'm wired for this, this crisis changes every single day, sometimes every single hour. And for the first time in 25 years as a leader, for me, I don't always know what to do instinctively in a crisis, you know, and I don't want to overstate that I always knew what to do, but I just feel like I've had the hardest time figuring out, you know, on Wednesday, we're going to do this. But then on Thursday, it's like, maybe not. And by Friday, we're not doing that. We're doing this, you know, and then, um, and then the president's going to speak and, you know, what's it going to mean? And so. I'm definitely feeling that pressure. And I think for me, that's been the hardest part um, is trying to make appropriate, decisive decisions for ways that we can serve and help today and keeping my team and everybody sort of aware of how fluid things are and everything could change in the next hour. Yeah, I've uh, used the word pivot repeatedly um, yeah. last couple of days and, you know, said to my team, OK, we're, we're at plan C. Tomorrow will be plan D. And then, you know, by the end of the week, we might be on plan N because things keep uh, evolving and changing. So we we are in the mode of being able to constantly pivot on new information. And that's been trying as a leader to be constantly in the in the place where you're you're having to change and make a new decision off a decision you just made. So uh, I agree with you. It's um, I'm a very decisive, quick decision type leader as well. I, I feel like I've always been in tune with what I should do. Um, and it's, it's very rare. I find myself in a place where I, I have to, you know, really stop myself and go, huh, um, I need to sit in this for a minute. So it's a unique place to be in where, you know, you're making decisions that are um, potentially life altering um, and, and life affecting and having to remake them multiple times throughout a day. It, it, there's certainly a ton of mental fatigue that I would say, mm. you know, leaders are probably feeling at this, this time is that you're, you know, we're carrying a burden of having to lead and make decisions constantly throughout a day. And uh, all day and all night, uh, but, but then the ramifications of, you know, the weight of what those decisions mean for people, um, people's health, really. So it's, 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 Hey, how many people have eye strain? I, I, I've seriously <laughs> had eye strain for like three days because of the text messages and the, you know, all the, just so much change going on every day. Kevin, you're probably fat. You're ahead of us, man. You're like over a week into eye strain, but I'm just like, yeah. man, my eyes are killing me. <laughs> yeah. I had a goal to decrease the screen time on my phone. That was my goal like three weeks ago, and I <laughs> totally failed horribly. My my yeah. phone keeps telling me every morning how I've increased my screen time every day. So yeah. yeah. Oh, I hear that. I'm popping these glasses off a lot to read a text these days. I'm like, I can't, yeah. I can't see. Kevin, hardest part of the challenge for you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think just there's no normalcy. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so little that's normal. You know, we, a lot of times we go through a crisis, we're like, let's just find our new normal. And I think yeah. we're just, uh, we just don't know what new normal is. And then I think, uh, all of you are, are heart, you know, you lead from the heart. And so when people that you love 
are and you can you can already forecast um, some of the challenges. You know, Nashville being a gig economy, and you just kind of forecast what what that's going to mean and what that's going to mean for the church. You know, you just you just hurt you hurt for people, and uh, and so I think, um, yeah, and then you bring family into that as well, and so uh, and so I think the part of us that hurts for people is what makes us leaders worth following. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that our hearts are connected. But um, but that's why yeah. we have to run and we have to get we have to grab truth. You know, there was a time where um, remember Moses and Aaron, they were in the wilderness and there was a plague that was spreading across the land and they got on their face. They put their face to the ground and they cried out to God. And God told Moses, tell Aaron, I want you to I want him to get up and I want him to run to the altar and get some fire. And I want him to go and I want him to take that fire and stand between the living and the dead. And it said that where he stood, the plague stopped. Wow. And uh, and we have to be the ones who run to the altar and get some fire. And I don't know how we stop the plague in the natural, but the plague in the spiritual, like that's our call. And we have we have the spirit of God. We have the fire of God. Like we are the ones who where we stand, that's where fear finds faith. And that's why people that's where people find peace. People find truth. But it was through feeling what they were feeling that that's what drove Moses and Aaron to their face. man. And I just think. um I think we have to we have to continue to put our nose to the carpet. This is not time to pray and say, God, would you bless our plans? <laughs> this yeah, is, yeah, yeah. God has changed in ministry. This is put your oh, face man. to the carpet until you receive the peace of God. And then you then we get up and we lead from that from that place. And uh and so I yeah. That's the that's the hard part. Yeah. Super that's super powerful. And I love it. I'm I'm thinking too. I was with some younger leaders last week as this yeah. was dropping, in like a mentoring group, and how different their reaction was from my initial reaction. Um, they were they, and I envied it. They were quickly moving to opportunities, and they were mm. quickly thinking about in the changing world what this could do to help people open their hearts and minds spiritually and to walk. And I really admired it. There is a negative to experience. Yeah. <laughs> and the negative yeah. is, I'm not so naive anymore. Mm-hmm. All of that can happen, but it's going to hurt. And, you yeah. know, like I, the first few days is the dominoes are dropping. I'm just being honest. I, I had a really hard time even getting to opportunity because we went through the Vegas recession, you know, mm-hmm. uh, well, the, the global, the national recession in 08, 09, but it felt like we were one of the key epicenters. And, and honestly, it was a 10-year climb back to normal mm. in a 10 years. Uh, so, and I, you know, all that's, so, the, my, so I'm just, you know, we're talking about how we're processing, what's the hardest part. One of my challenges is uh, the burden of experience. There's a blessing to experience, right? Mm. And then there's a mm-hmm. burden you carry with experience. Yep. And I found myself having to say, hey, I, Okay, that's your experience, Judd, but but you you you, you got to work through those emotions and it, be honest about it, but don't let it stop you from this sort of beautiful naivete of faith that I'm seeing in leaders. We got to get to the opportunities as well. Of course, the challenge is we still don't even know what we're facing, so it's hard to get the opportunities, but anyway, <clears throat> that's been a me that I'm continuing to wrestle out. I appreciate your honesty. I, I would uh, go ahead, Tricia. Oh, sorry. I was even going to say, um, and, and on the flip side of that, um, recognizing that there, e- even if you're quick to move and quick to decide or quick to adjust or quick to um, live in a new normal, there are so, there's a bunch of people around us who aren't. So, you know, as a leader, uh, you know, sometimes I got to pull off the gas for a second and say, I might feel like I've made this decision today. That's probably going to change in an hour from now. But it's like everybody around me, are, are they in a place where they can move? Can they react? Or do they need time to process and marinate and um, get right with themselves? And, and, and also trying to not push it, right? So trying to advance, um, you know, advance things every day in a way that feels like it's positive and momentous and, and bringing hope and bringing action. And what are the, what, what are we doing tomorrow that we're not doing today? And, and recognizing that there are so many people who they aren't there yet. They're not ready to hear about what they're going to do next. They just need a minute to sit in it and um, absorb 
the information and and feel their feel their faith and talk to God and and they don't care about what they're going to do tomorrow. You know, they they need to feel what it is they're doing right now, let, and let that be okay and give tons of grace in those moments to, to let them not feel like they're ready to move. That's a really good point. Um, one of the things I know in my about my leadership is I process things quickly. And sometimes I realize I've already moved on, but like everybody else is still stuck a couple hours ago. I would say the hardest thing for me, just to weigh in quick for leaders on, on this crisis, is the multiplicity of things happening right now. There, you know, the global financial collapse, the uh, and markets that normally run in opposite, like bonds and gold going down while stocks are going down, while the oil prices are collapsing, while borders are closing, while continents are shuttered, while airlines are going bankrupt, while people are quarantined in their homes, and like hundreds of millions over this disease. It's like, wow, this is this is just crazy. And then, you know, I don't know whether you would agree with this, in past crises, you can almost see the landing point. Like if it was you know, a landing place. It's like, okay, if this is like a downturn, the market's gone from bull to bear. All right. Well, you know that six months to a year from now, it's going to bounce back or a decade from now, it's going to bounce back, Judd. Um, But I don't know where the landing place is on this one. That is really, really hard to see. And I don't even know that we know where the bottom is, you know, it's like, or what this does with this kind of dislocation. And so that has me, my prayer life has become much more rich very quickly and not that it wasn't present before, but I mean, these are like heartfelt, like God, I have no idea what's going on right now. And yet here we are, we're the leaders for a moment like this. Um, Judd, do you want to talk a little bit more about the three crises that you've led or are leading through the the financial crisis of 08, 09, which lasted a decade in Vegas, the mass shootings a couple of years ago, and then today, have you got a few principles that you have said, hey, in the past, this is different, but in the past, these have helped us? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, we, we, we've covered some of those sort of core things that I think um, uh, when I think back over over those yeah. experiences, um, I, I typically it, it, as a church leader, but I would think as a business leader, as an organization leader, like, the typical first response is we gather rapidly. We get we get our people together rapidly. We need yeah. to be in community. Now, now <laughs> that's the whatever we're going through now is throwing a total wrench in that, right? Like, mm-hmm. but yeah. I think online um, with uh, with virtual communities. So what we're going through now is thrown kind of a wrench in that. But on, on, online with virtual communities. Uh, you gather rapidly. Uh, I think uh, we all, you know, a few things that we've been to. Uh, well, my first thing in any crisis is I get with my lead team and, you know, we start to talk and process and we start meeting daily, if not two or three times a day, um, virtually to sort work, you know, to work through real time information. Uh, we start deploying teams for the best ways that we can serve our city. We're often thinking about first responders and ways we can help first responders or their kids or their families or their spouses, because in any situation, even in a full quarantine situation, first responders, they do not get to sit home and watch Netflix, (laughs) you know, like they still have to be out there right in the middle of it. So there's a whole lot of people, even in the most extreme lockdown situations that aren't locked down. And uh, how, how do we serve them? How do we, how can we help them? These are all sort of questions that, that we ask, but, I think once I get over that initial heartbreak of what a crisis is, I remember that the church, the faith community, we're made for moments like this. This mm. is where we're at our best. This is this is you know this is when we shine, and I just um, you know try to keep looking ahead and keep our team looking ahead to the fact that God is still in control and God can use this in people's lives. And um, how do we leverage that? How do we serve? How do we help our, so our question is always, how do we serve? Our question is always, what can we do for our community? What does our community need? Not what do we want to do, but what do they need? And then one thing that's helpful for us is there's a whole lot of things they may need, but we, you know, I, I like the old the acronym. It's actually a test you can use called the ICE test. And, uh, you know, that's something that we've, I would say, like roughly in conversation laid over different opportunities. 
And it's just an acronym. It stands for impact, confidence, and ease. When you're looking at 50 things you can do for the community, all right, what, what would have the greatest impact on the community of these five ideas? Uh, what do we have the greatest confidence in that we can, um, that we, you know, it, it will have that impact and that we can pull off? And from an ease and implementation standpoint, and I would even say not just ease, but experience. What do we have the experience here to do? Like, um, you know, you could immediately go to, well, we're going to, we're going to help first responders by providing free childcare for their kids. But if you're in the middle of a viral situation, yeah. right? Yeah. Now you're bringing kids onto your campus that are potentially exposed from a family standpoint. Legal's got to get involved. Oh, there are all these layers, right, that fall. And you might lay, you know, an ice kind of framework over something like that and say, we're, we're going to do it. That still fits our criteria. Or you might say, let's let's find other community organizations that are doing that. Like in our, in our case, uh, thankfully, our city's providing that child care once the school's closed for... Um, for first responders, so so then it's like, well, what can we do for the for the, our city officials? They're better prepared to handle that, but maybe we can come alongside them, or we can provide uh, that support, or let them know we're here for them. So, okay, super helpful. You know, it's interesting. I hadn't heard of ICE before, but that is totally a helpful framework. I realized I think I've used that <laughs> without ever knowing it. Now I've got it. That's brilliant. That's really brilliant. Uh, okay. Kevin, um, again, the double recent crisis. Um, any principles that have helped you so far that you're like, you know, I loved your idea of, of the non-anxious presence. Anything else that you would share with leaders that you're like, hey, when I do this, it tends to go better. So the first thing I do is I call Judd. And <laughs> Judd, I think your phone just blows up at a time like this. Everybody I know is calling Judd. That's so true. Yeah, so, so we say that. Uh, um, you know, I, I think um, uh, something that's been helpful for me and might be helpful for some other leaders is just to remind yourself that you were, you, like, you were built for this, that you mm -hmm. were called to this, that God has put your feet where they are on the planet, and and we go with the confidence of like that God calls. So I, my brother actually gave me a plaque when I started at Crosspoint that says, "You were built for this," and so that's kind of become a mantra. Is that I just remind myself there are things that God has put in my backpack along the journey that I'm using now because it's part of His. And we talk about calling wherever wherever God has called us to. There are things that He's used to build into us. Um, you know, the other thing I, in, in the interview process, I told Crosspoint, they were asking me questions and I just knew it was where God had called me. And so one time they asked me a question, I didn't know the answer. And so uh, and so I said, they said, well, what would you do if this happened? And I said, well, I don't know. We got a lot of smart people. We'd get around the table and we'd figure it out together. And uh, that was what I said in the interview. Where normally it, I would have maybe made something up, but I just knew that uh, I knew. And I didn't know that it was going to be tor tornado and a coronavirus. I didn't know that was, but but I think um, what Jess said, there's just something to getting around the table, whether it's in person or whether it's virtually, and locking eyes with one another and saying we're we're in this, we're in this together. And then um and then I'm, you know, the other thing is tr continuing to ask ourselves like what 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 are the things that we what are the things that we can do that will bring peace to people that are on our team. And uh, mm -hmm. and so I'm just trying to care for the needs of the, of of the people in the team. It really felt like. We were fighting a battle on, on you know, two fronts. We had disaster relief in the community and helping people rebuild. And then we had how do we figure out how to pull off Sunday? And, uh, and so the team, set up, the team set up portable church for thousands in 48 hours. And it was remarkable. It was incredible. And so like, okay, let's celebrate that. You know, we, we can celebrate that win. And you guys, what you did, if we would have asked, hey, guys, how long do you think it would take for us to, for us to do portable church for thousands um, you know, we're going to do it six months from now. They'd be like, okay, we can mm -hmm. do it six months. Oh no, we need at least three months. But they did it in 48 hours, which is remarkable, which is a test. I mean, it, it is, it, it attests to the truth that like Jesus said, if you have faith in mustard seed, you can move a mountain. It's going to take faith, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. We're in one of those, at that teaching, he said, he said, you know, basically anything's possible like for those who believe. And so I think this is one of those times where you go, okay, God, what is the mountain that you want to move? And then, uh, it's going to take a lot of people working together with humility with integrity, with relational unity, and let's get scrappy. Uh, let's figure it out. So, um, yeah, so that's that's where I feel like we've we've been. But now we just add one more battle onto the front, <laughs> which is uh, which yeah, that was last. Yeah. yeah, that was last week. Portable church it lasted seven days, one day, and now you're into virtual church. It's insane what you guys have navigated. 
Tricia, any thoughts that have really helped you? I mean, you just went through that massive transition into the CEO role a couple months ago yourself, right? Welcome to the new role. Yes. <laughs> um, it's like feet to the fire. What's she going to do now? Um, no, it, it's it's actually been great. I think I, I could not agree more. Um, having the right leaders, the right people around you is so important. Um, we have an amazing leadership team. Um, I... I do nothing like, you know, I do nothing alone at the end of the day. Um, yeah. The rallying the troops and um, for us getting around the tables easy. We're used to jumping on video like this all the time. We do it all. It's what we know how to do. So for us, it's um, jump on video and, and really start, you know, thinking through, you know, uh, where are we at? What are the, what are the problems we need to solve? What are we hearing? So I think uh, first and foremost, having the right people to surround yourself with, whether it's, inside your day-to-day, personally, mentors, professionally, um, all those things are so relevant to, uh, for a support system as a leader. You know, we, we need the right support systems for ourselves and um, great leaders uh, aside from ourselves to um, make the right decisions. But um, so that's been really important. And, and I think um, caring, I, I, um, I think, you know, as leaders, we, we shepherd a bunch, we shepherd people. Whether we're leading a church or we're leading an organization, um, you know, I'm shepherding thousands of people right now who are who are scared, who are uncertain. And I think um, um, showing heart and concern and, and I am genuinely concerned for so many individuals who are so scared right now. I mean, oddly enough, um, in in the midst of crisis, I am typically am naturally very calm. Um, I, I'm just wired that way where I'm not, and I'm not an overreactor, which is odd because I am an Enneagram eight and a high mm. D and all things that would say I should completely overreact in crisis. But for whatever reason, when crisis hits, I'm, I'm, I'm the most calm. So, um, leveraging that to, um, to, to, to really shepherd the people that I feel are, need it. Um, and let them know that they're cared for and gosh, all the grace in the world right now. Um, so I think those are the two things, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people and just offering a ton of grace and, and really genuinely caring for the people that our community that needs it. So, um, we've, we've hinted at it numerous times, but virtual church is on the radar of pretty much every leader listening. Now that's new, probably work from home virtual teams, you know, that was kind of a novelty, the whole gig economy. Now it's a new normal and there will be exceptions, but for the most part, let's just assume by the time this podcast goes live or very soon after, we're all going to be working from home. We're all going to be leading remote teams. We're all going to be, yeah, just trying to figure our way through that. You've had a lot of experience in that. And one of my favorite parts of your story, Brian reminded me of this last week, is you started less than a decade ago as his assistant. And now you're the CEO of a major, you know, national leading company, which is amazing, Tricia. But can you walk us through just in broad strokes? And there's so much more at um, BelaySolutions.com, et cetera. But can you walk us through some broad strokes of like best practices and here's some things to avoid when it comes to leading virtual teams or virtual organizations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you, Brian. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, le- leading virtually, um, working virtually, it does have it has its own subset of challenges. Um, first and foremost, it's it's very easy to find yourself in a place where you're in a silo because you're home, working in your office, and you're not physically around all the people that you're used to being around. And I think being very intentional right out the gate to have plans to combat that with lots of video conferencing. So I, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record when I talk about video conferencing, but um, we are all about it. this right here, what we are doing, this, this replaces what used to be you sitting at a conference table or somebody sitting in your office. Mm-hmm. So recognizing that right away and making sure that that happens for us has been crucial. When we first started the business, we didn't mandate, if you will, video conferencing. We were conference calls, right? So we were, we were all on the listening, but we weren't seeing each other. And we very quickly figured out that we were missing an element of body language and facial expression like it's great to be here and be able to see your faces even though we're not in the same room together there's so much value to be added so you know the first big thing i would say for anybody is you know 
get on Skype, get on Zoom, get webcams to your team, the equipment they need to be able to do these things and, and make it happen. It will make a, a very big difference regardless of what you're trying to, what you're leading through. Um, it, it adds a great proponent to being able to see people. Um, I also would say you will probably have to be more maniacal than ever with your schedule. And I know, Carrie, mm. you have a whole course on scheduling. Um, <laughs> deal work week and all the things like you won't have the opportunity to walk down the hallway and pop into somebody's office and tell them X, Y, and Z. So those, um, water cooler office pop in moments go away. So for us, what we do is we assume we will have things we're going to have to talk to certain people about and we schedule them proactively. I have standing meetings with every single person on my team that I may or may not have something to talk about with. <laughs> so mm. I those are just recurring. And if, if by chance we have nothing, we can cancel them. Um, but let's be honest, that really never happens. So, um, you know, have your, your core individuals pre-scheduled and, and meet with the, you know, your, your direct leaders of the people that you need to be in room with as frequently as possible. And then also your leadership team, we do the same thing for our leadership team. Uh, we have a cadence with which we have got to be together on video at least a few hours a week. And when do we schedule that? How do we mandate that? So um, so I would say being really maniacal and, and intentional about creating virtual FaceTime will be important to be successful. And then even when you do all of that great stuff, there's still, you will start to notice communication gaps because mm -hmm. you're still going to miss the meet in the lobby, saw you in the elevator, like all that stuff goes away. You're still going to uncover gaps in communication. So developing a, a pretty aggressive communication plan, it, it's going to sound like it's aggressive, but there will still be gaps in communication. So we use multiple channels in addition to video. You know, we have um, our leadership team has group text that we, we communicate with each other via texting. Um, we have instant messaging groups. We use um, Chatter, which is an IM feature of Salesforce, which is the CRM application we use. But even if it's Gchat, like some instant messaging type of area where you don't want to send an email. You're not going to talk to somebody on video, but you need a quick and dirty response and you kind of don't want to blow up somebody's phone. So instant message is a great place to get the quick and dirty communication or like a Slack channel. A lot of people out there using mm -hmm. Slack for those. Yeah, we use Slack for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then and putting into, um, you know, aggressive communication strategies to make sure that gaps aren't missed. You'll probably uncover over time that... Um, you, you need to be in front of people way more than you thought you were going to have to be in front of people. So um, if I can underscore that for a moment, we'll link to a blog post, but Tricia, what you're saying is so critical. When I went into leading virtual teams, it's amazing how intentional you have to be about which channel um, is used for what, because otherwise you get into the non-ending text wars or email wars that will literally destroy your day. You found similar things. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you really have to define, you know, we're going to save our Zoom, you know, our, our video conference meetings. This is, these are going to be the topics we cover. This is, these are the type of things we're going to email about. And then these are the type of questions that we're going to instant message or text about and kind of defining the place where everything's going to exist. Bingo. So everyone has really clear communication marching orders. Yep. That could be different for everybody. It's, it's really based on preference, what those channels are that work for you. But, um, so I would say, you know, setting really clear expectations, over communicating um, and mandating video would be the like key places I would start if I was going to start working from home tomorrow. That's what I would tell everybody. Great. Well, I want to honor all of your time. I got a few questions left. I know this is like minutes are like hours and hours are like days and days are like weeks, aren't they in the season that we're in right now? It's insane. Um, any other pitfalls to avoid in crisis management for leaders that uh, any of you have run into? I would add one, which is reacting in public. Uh, that I, I tend to be very reactionary at times. You know, I am an aide as well, so I have opinions on everything, whether they're well formed or not. And uh, reacting in public has never done me any service. So it's sort of I need to take in the information 
kind of, okay, thank you. Be very neutral. Go process it. Go figure it out. Go pray about it. Go digest it with the team. Sometimes that can happen in 30 seconds. Sometimes that needs 30 minutes or longer. So uh, yeah, I, I, I would say that's something that I just have to remind myself, don't react in public. And when in doubt, well, I don't know whether you can sleep on it most days these days, but often in a crisis, you're like, okay, I'm going to take a quick break and come back later with an idea. I think to just piggyback on that, which is so good, Carrie, is uh, a similar idea, which is don't pretend you have all the answers. You know, mm. it's, oh, there's a human element to this yeah. to say, uh, oh, we're going to figure this out. You know, here's what I always say. Oh, every crisis we face, I said it. This weekend, um, the way you get through a crisis is together. You know, mm-hmm. together we're going to pray for each other. Together we're going to support one another. <laughs> together, even if we can't meet in person, we're going to, you know, we're going to incur. Even if there's no toilet paper, even if, you know, like we're going to do it together, and we're going to figure it out together. You know, we, you don't have to get up in a crisis. You need to portray hope and confidence and some calm, but you don't have to act like you have all the answers. Right. Yeah. Right. This reminds me a little bit of what Andy Stanley has said at different times, that clarity is more important than certainty. And I think we all crave certainty, but sometimes you just have to be clear. It's like, we're not 100% sure what's ahead, but today, this is what we're going to do. And tomorrow, I'll let you know if there's another step. Yeah, and I would say um, really pragmatic for church leaders. Like, um, don't feel like you have to communicate your plans for everything on Wednesday. (laughs) <laughs> uh, we didn't drop our, we, we, our, my plan right now is I'll, is I'll communicate what's happening on the weekend late on some point at some point on Friday or even Saturday morning. It's a social world. Everybody will get it immediately. But my hope then we may have a lot more communications, but those communications will kind of define what we know. And then what we don't know, we're going to say, expect an announcement, you know, on this and this and this. At this time, because, you know, this last week, there was just too much uh, whiplash going on, right, for everybody, right? We make you make a decision on Wednesday, you make an announcement. Yeah. And um, I was really tempted to do that. In fact, I shot the video and then I said, hold it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I shot, I had like three videos in the can and in the end, I did a written public statement on Friday. So that's just, but I, but I think one learning and I'm reminding myself of, of other crises and tragedies we've gone through. It was like a reminder to me, like, yeah, Judd. Don't don't communicate too early what's still unknown. You know, if you can delay, it's okay. You don't have to have your plan for this weekend on Monday. Hmm. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Hey, yeah, I like delay is okay. And plus it rhymes. So Yeah, that makes it even better. You can preach that. That'll preach. Delay is okay. I'm on I'm on board with it. Yeah. Um how do you keep yourself encouraged? We sort of started there. I want to wrap up there. Um, can I can I share the day after the tornado? I uh, I went back and I looked in my journal and I saw that I was that God called me to Cross Point back in just in prayer on March third, three years earlier. And so I think going back and reading through the journal, like I just realized it was three years today. And I said, God, I I'll go to Cross Point if you want me to. It was before I had any conversations with them. And I spelled cross point with an E, so I spelled it wrong. But I, um, but it was like in that moment in prayer, like I just knew that was what God was calling to do. And I hadn't even talked with anybody, but it was through that that God, that God used that to help me find faith. And then, Carrie, I went to the scriptures, and I was like, God, you're going to have to speak to me because I got, I, got, <laughs> I got nothing. I mean, there was just a desperation. And I came, I was reading through my Bible reading plan. Sometimes when like, you don't know what to do, go back to your plan. So I went back, and I was reading my Bible reading plan. I was reading about um, the Exodus when they were going through the wilderness and I'm reading it in the message these days. And it said that they were constructing the tent and it said that they put dolphin skin on top of the tent. Oh yeah. We and talked like, about this. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, who put that in my Bible? Right. I'm like who put dolphin skin in my Bible? And I was like, that's crazy. I've never read that before. And so then I started looking, where did the dolphin, where did dolphin skin come from? They're in the wilderness. And then went back and looked at some of the rabbis when they talked about it, they said, that, uh, that the last time they would have encountered dolphins would have been at the Red Sea. And so when they're crossing over the Red Sea, this is not Peter friendly, but when they're crossing the Red Sea, they see a dolphin and they're like, hey, we should keep that thing and we should skin that thing. Like there were rednecks in the wilderness. They're like, let's skin that thing. And then they, let's put it on. And God says, put it on top of the tent so that every time they went to worship, they'd be able to look up and see 
that God got him through the Red Sea. And if God got him through the Red Sea, he was going to get him through the wilderness. And so then what that did for me, it helped me go, you know what? There are things in my past that God has brought me through Mm -hmm. that I can hold strength and I can find faith from knowing that just like he brought me through that, he's going to bring me through this again. And so just that one word, man, that was manna. <laughs> that was mm. manna for that. And mm. that was a word that I held on to. And, uh, and it just, it bolstered my faith. So I think going back to the things we know to do, going back to prayer, going back to the scriptures, getting that word for the day that we can help because we can share that with others and, and help build their faith too. So, uh, so yeah, that's one way that, um, that I encourage, encourage myself, right? Draw courage off of, uh, off of that. Yeah. Dolphin skin. So I want to thank you for my next devotional thought. <laughs> Judd's going to put that in his next book, No Attribution, just so you know, Kevin. Okay, zero attribution. <laughs> no attribution. I was reading in the scripture the other day. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought to myself, yeah. Dolphin skin. <laughs> Dolphin skin. Uh, thank you, Eugene Peterson, right? Eugene Peterson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every nugget I've ever had was from some Eugene Peterson. Book. <laughs> Judd, how do you keep yourself encouraged? Have well, you? Yeah, part of it is just this, what we're doing right here. you got to keep laughing in a crisis. Yeah. Not to minimize it, but so you don't lose your mind. You know, mm-hmm. like you just got to keep laughing. And I don't, this, I've laughed more in the last 24 hours, privately, not publicly. Not, I just mean, and not in a way that's contrite about what's happening. At, you know, my mom used to say, you either cry or you laugh. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you need to do both, right? <laughs> but, I, but I've felt like there's great therapy in appropriate humor and just laughing at how crazy this the whole thing is that whatever it is we're facing and how it drops so fast, it releases stress. So when I'm with my core team, that's a big value of ours is um, we take it seriously and we're, you know, we're not, um, I think you can, I think there's a fine line of minimizing what's happening. That's just denial and it's not helpful. Right. But it's also okay to just acknowledge that, man, I don't even know how else to deal with this except to find ways to laugh about life in the middle of all this stuff. And so I do that. I've been doing that a lot. Mm. It's good. Tricia, how do you keep your head in the game, heart in the game? Yeah, so I would say um, one of our core values is fun. We don't take ourselves too seriously, seriously. So, um, mm. I, you know, there's there's always uh, moments to find humor to get us through anything. And um, for me, I, you know, I'm kind of a silver lining girl a little bit. So I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, not to minimize the crisis we're in and what people are feeling, but I really believe in my heart and my soul that we're going to be all right. Hmm. You know, God's going to get us through. We're going to be on the other side. Life, life might look a little different than it used to, but we, we have successfully made it through all the things that were in our past all the way up to today. We've made it through them and we'll make it through the days ahead as well. So I really just have faith in the fact that, um, We've we've gotten this far and, and, and we're all right and, and we will be tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. And so I just I just innately in my core really do believe that. And I think if at any time I feel like that's I'm on shaky ground on those things, I think it's just connecting with the right people that if hmm. my faith feels low or my my silver lining, I can't see it that um, I connect with the right people, my core people that can can help me see it. And that, that'd be where I would lean in. Mm. Yeah, I would, I would just, yeah, go ahead. Chad. I just feel like we, we just need to say again, we are going to be all right. Yeah. We're going to get yeah. through this, right. whatever it is. I grabbed my wife's hand last night and I said, hey, thank God we have a roof over our head right now. Mm-hmm. We don't have to worry about forever right now. We yeah. have food in our stomachs and we have a ministry we're called to. We're going to be fine. Yeah. It's good. But it's a different priority than it was last week when I was thinking, how much do we have in the bank? And, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, now it's less uh, worrying about what you get if your spring break plans are ruined. Now it's what you're worried about. Uh, uh, it's like, how dare they close Disney? You know, now it's, yeah, it's funny what you thought was a crisis. Yes. Right. Yeah. The crisis that we weren't going to get to go to the beach in two weeks. Now yeah. it's a little different. <laughs> and we're going to lead it at our best, I believe. And we're going to rise yeah. to the occasion. And, and I, I'm praying a national revival, a global revival. Yeah. Break. Mm. yeah of all of this so 
you know, I know we're right in the middle of the shock factor right now, but um, I think it's okay. That's part of how I keep going, right? As I know God yeah. is going to use this for his fame and his glory in his name. Yeah. Amen. You know, there's a couple thoughts, Kevin, as you were talking, I don't know why <clears throat> it's a dolphin skin, which now will be in every pulpit in America this weekend, by the way, just so you know. So um, <laughs> the dolphin skin reminded me of a message I preached a few years ago, just God's faithfulness in the past is evidence of his faithfulness in the future. And I think when those Israelites were at the edge of the Red Sea, they're like, well, this is it. How are we going to die? You want to drown or you want to get slaughtered by the Egyptians? And God's like, hold out your hands. And the strong east wind comes. And the next thing you know, the waters are parting. And they're like, are you kidding me? And I'm not, I'm not saying there'll be like an instant you know, recovery here, but God has a way. And his faithfulness in the past is evidence of that. I would affirm what you said earlier, somewhere in the conversation, one of you said, you, you were made for this. Like, I, I think God chose you to be born the year you were born in, uh, put you in the position you are right now and chose you for such a time like this. So I would encourage that. I think that's very, very true. And then we are really a people of hope. That's it. And we dealers are brokers of hope, uh, not unreal hope, not denial, not minimization, but just like actual hope. And out of death comes resurrection and somehow we'll find it. So, wow. I want to thank you for encouraging um, all of us today. And if you have a final thought or two, and then just tell us where we can find you on the socials and any website you would point us to, because I think everybody's looking for good people to follow. And that's why I wanted you three on this call, because you're good people to follow in a time like this. One one final thought that I would, I would want to share. Um, there's a book called Reading the, Reading the Bible Through Western Eyes, and it talks about how um, no seminary students real, remembered that there was a famine in the prodigal son story in the United States, but mm. it was in the third world developing countries that, that that word famine jumped out. And it was through a famine that the, that the son, the younger son came to his senses and he returned home. And so my prayer is that God would bring a great awakening that he would through, um, through the experience that God would leverage it fully for his glory and that people would wake up and they would realize that there's a father who's waiting for him with open arms. And so this is our, this is our hour. This is our time to, uh, to demonstrate the love of the love of the father. And I think there are people who are hungry for hope like they've never been before. And, uh, and I think he's been preparing us as the church, as the big C church for such a time as this, um, to present that, uh, that message this time. And, uh, and man, I, you know, I don't think any of us would choose to lead in this hour, but God chose us and he's positioned, and he's placed us and he's given us everything we need in Christ and through his spirit to lead well. So thank you, Carrie, for that, that message of encouragement for people. And Kevin on social, just Kevin Queen on Instagram. Yeah, just at, at, at Kevin Queen on, uh, on Instagram. Yep. And can you, can you mention the Crosspoint site as well? Because uh, you do have a crisis going on, and uh, I gave to it, and I would love other people to as well. <laughs> yeah, people can go to uh, crosspoint.tv slash Nashville Strong. And, uh, and on that site, there's an opportunity to, uh, to give toward, um, toward disaster relief and toward ministry recovery as we're, kind of, as we're in the middle of that crisis as well. Yeah. Tricia, where can people find you online and any closing thoughts? Yeah, I would just say to, to close out, you know, uh, to, to all of our point, we'll be all right. Um, I'm glad to have spent this time with um, you three gentlemen. It's been it's been an amazing um, conversation. I'm glad to be part of it. Um, I you can find uh, BelaySolutions.com. Um, we are we're really putting down some resources for anybody who feels like they are trying to figure out the new normal, what it like, what it's like to work and live, do life, do life virtually. So um, there's some resources on our website, more to come. And you can find me individually, Trisha M. Shortino on Instagram as well. Um, and trying to just support the remote work movement. If anybody needs resources, you can kind of hit me up there. Judd. Oh, yeah, I just appreciate everybody's thoughts. It's been really encouraging. And this is the beauty of getting with leaders. It's, it's Carrie, it's why I love your podcast. It's why I listen always and, and tune in and get not only inspiration, I feel like I'm part of a, a larger global family of all of us just trying to figure it out. <laughs> That's what we're trying yeah, to do, thanks. buddy. Holy Chris, cow. It's been awesome to meet you and, and uh, Kevin, love you, man. And just to hear how you're leading is tremendous. 
Um, you know, this is uh, Christians. We're actually experts at how to deal with pandemics. We have 2000 years of experience on how to do it. And um, a lot of fascinating reading when you start looking at how we handled pandemics in Rome and Germany and Europe, London. Um, maybe not always the best medical advice, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but but I, 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 I would just I would just say this, that that as as you know, from your reading of church history, like what turned in large part the the popular tide in Rome um, from persecution of Christians to a more general acceptance view of Christians was directly connected to how the faith community responded in the plague. And everybody ran and ran for the hills and people were leaving their family members out to die on the street. And Christians said, no, we don't we don't run. We don't leave our post. And they went and took care of these picked these people up off the street. You know, some of them took them in their own homes, took care of them. And the way they loved them made a difference. Rodney Stark at Baylor says that um, if you look through the spread of uh, the epidemics in, in throughout the Roman Empire in the in the cities where there was a large Christian community, he believes, based on his sociological study, that the death rate was up to 50 percent lower than in cities where there wasn't a strong Christian community because of the way they loved and cared for their neighbors. And I just say that because we have a chance right now and we don't know how it's going to look in a potentially locked down virtual world. But we have a chance to love our neighbors, whether it's virtually, whether it's through a phone call, whether it's through technology. And if we love them well, uh, we could not only make a huge impact in their spiritual lives, but we could shine a light for the whole world to see. And we could change people's view of the Christian faith. Hmm. Well, let's leave it there. And uh, Judd, you're on Insta and also uh, uh, is it centralonline.tv? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Centralonline.tv. Well, wow, thank you so much, Tricia, Kevin, Judd. You have encouraged a lot of leaders and helped a lot of leaders today. And thank you for your leadership in the midst of this crisis. I uh, really appreciate you guys. Thank you. It's been an honor.